Um, let me uh, introduce Professor Tomaso Dorigo. It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce him. Uh, he's a senior member of uh, the same collaboration in which I work. Uh, and <clears throat> Uh, so, Professor Dorigo is a first researcher at INF in Padova and a professor at the University of Padova. He has been a member of the CMS experiment uh, at CERN since 2001 and previously a member of uh, CDF experiment at Farmilab uh, from 1995 till 2012. Uh, he has research interests in particle physics, uh, statistics, machine learning, and differential programming, and is the author of about 1,600 publications, um, which include several publications on statistics and uh, machine learning. Uh, he has been playing a leadership, playing leadership roles in various research organizations. A few noted ones are uh, president of the USARN organization, a network for interdisciplinary research, uh, and education with uh, 21,000 members, uh, coordinator of the MOD collaboration uh, group uh, with a cutting edge research program at the crossroads of particle physics and artificial intelligence. Uh, he's the scientific coordinator of uh, AMVA4 New Physics ETN, uh, founded by Horizon 2020. The list is long. He's, uh, he has been the chair of uh, CMS Statistics uh, Committee. I have uh, seen him most in that role and uh, a convener of several research and analysis groups in, in CDF and CMS. Um, he is also editor of two Elsevier published journals, Reviews in Physics and Physics Open. Um, so, uh, and he uh, he's an avid speaker, uh, delivers lectures around the world on this topic on which uh, we uh, we are lucky to have him as a as a speaker. Um, so, it includes uh, fifteen postgraduate schools in physics, statistical statistics, and mechanic, uh, machine learning. Apart from his teachings at the University of Padova, um, and. Uh, it, so uh, we, we indeed are, are very grateful to have him uh, and for agreeing to deliver lectures at this, school, at this school. He will be delivering lectures on statistics in particle physics and differential programming. Um, despite uh, facing quite a few difficulties, uh, like having to renew his passport, uh, et cetera, uh, he, uh, he managed to come for this and uh, was earlier than us this morning uh, to, to reach the hall. So, and I, I, I should mention that I have known, uh, I have been an avid reader of, uh, of his blogs. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, you, uh, you visit his, his site. Um, so it's a pleasure to uh, invite. My pleasure. Dorigo, My pleasure. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in India, and so I'm enjoying looking around, and uh, I see many bright people in front of me, and I hope I won't disappoint you. So uh, after this uh, incredible uh, detailed introduction, uh, I'm very happy of that. Uh, uh, that burned about uh, five slides of mine because I had my own personal <laughs> introduction, but we will go through that very quickly. So. Um, yeah, let's, uh, since we are on the clock, let's, uh, let's go to it. Uh, this is me, my wife and my dog. <laughs> and, uh, okay, uh, all of this has been said already, so we'll blitz through it, okay? Uh, I'll mention the user and organization because it's something uh, that's, uh, that's going on, uh, I, as, as, as I think it's transpired in the presentation that was uh, just given, I'm interested in outreach and uh, popularization of science and doing science across borders. There is an organization that does this uh, unifying all sciences and all scientists across borders of countries, religion, and the disciplines. And uh, we do it uh, 
uh, it's a for free organization and I'm very happy to be president since last November. And we give a prize every year to the best uh, under 40 year old scientists who do breakthroughs in five big areas of science. I hope I will see you, one of you on the podium one of the next few years, who knows. Um, as I was said, I'm a member and a co-member of the CMS experiment uh, at the CERN Large Hadron Collider. That's where I come from, basically, uh, scientifically. My career has been in uh, hadronic collider physics. Um, and uh, I've, I've done a few things there. Uh, but I'm also moving towards other things because, you know, particle physicists uh, can recycle themselves very well and do other things. So, well, this is a particle physics experiment. It's called SWIGO, SWGO, Southern Whitefield Gamma Observatory Experiment. It will be constructed probably in Chile in the high altitude uh, planes uh, there because uh, we can record cosmic rays from, uh, from the sky. And that will be what we will focus on in the last two lectures uh, in four days when uh, I will show you one can put together a, an optimization pipeline to uh, yes, optimize this experiment, which is made of many, many, many different water Cherenkov tanks on the ground to detect these uh, flows of particles. And we want to optimize it with differentiable programming. That will be the focus of the last two lectures. Um, I, it was told that uh, this uh, idea that we can optimize end-to-end -end the experiments led me to found and direct this collaboration that was mentioned. Earlier on, I'd been in the CDF experiment. Uh, and OK, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, it is here in the first experiment that I actually took part in that uh, I realized that, uh, well, that was a 600 people experiment, not 3,000 or 4,000 like the big LHC experiments that uh, today are like corporations. <laughs> but uh, 600 is already a large number. And there you interact with many people with different backgrounds. And you realize that uh, particle physics, uh, you can't do it without uh, uh, knowing statistics well. Because uh, we are looking for phenomena that are rare. And when you are looking for rare phenomena, you have to do with uh, few events, few, few things, not, not uh, hundreds, not billions of, uh, of uh, stars in the galaxy or whatever you want. Uh, uh, yes, we collide uh, billions and billions of protons and antiprotons, but in the end, it all boils down to really understanding and making inference about few events. And when few events are the matter, then statistics needs to be called in. You cannot do without it. And uh, I realized that uh, uh, we are trained as physicists and we have uh, broad backgrounds in theoretical physics, in uh, particle detectors, and uh, all that there is between quantum physics, but we often don't pick up uh, what is actually most useful to us in our daily life, when we actually get to it and become uh, researchers and start uh, producing scientific results. And that is the use of statistics. We don't get too much of it. We don't get enough of it, at least uh, in Italy, in my courses, I didn't get enough of it. And I was uh, basically oblivious of many, many things that you need to pick up during your courses if you can, or you will have to study them later on. And it's, it's heavier on you because as we progress in our lives, things get more complicated time-wise, right? And, uh, and I realized that uh, in 600 people, maybe there were 15 or 20 people who actually did know statistics well enough. And in the country of uh, the blind man, the one-eyed man is a king. So you actually, it pays off a lot, okay? Now in the CMS experiment, which I mentioned a little while before, I was in the chair of the statistics committee there and uh, there is the need of a statistics committee. What do we do? Yes, every, every, every physics group has people that uh, go together and uh, 
and analyze the data and produce results, but it's a continuous influx in these large experiments of people that have strong bases in physics, but don't know very much statistics. And they are the ones that analyze the data and produce the results. And we have uh, our, 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 our hands full in looking at these results and finding that they are produced by ad hoc techniques that have no, no, uh, no connection to statistic textbooks because people make up things, okay? Because if they don't know how to do something properly, they will make up things. And so that we have a problem, right? And it's a continuous influx of bright minds that are not very knowledgeable of statistics. So I hope we can fill that gap with you in these lectures at least to sensitize you on the matter. I, I may be speaking to the wrong audience and we may well be very knowledgeable because you had the luck of having good teachers or having good courses or studies and you picked up these things already. But in my experience, it's not always the case, okay? So, and there is no shame in it, okay? We are all ignorant before, before we are knowledgeable. So let's, let's uh, try to fill these gaps together, okay? Uh, the blog was mentioned. Uh, I'm still doing it after 18 years. I published 1,500 uh, uh, outreach posts there, and uh, the blog is read by, uh, has been read by 15 million people. Uh, and here are ways that you can contact me. I hope you will. I'm happy to chat about anything that uh, has to do with the topics of these lectures. Uh, if you have questions about what we will be discussing today or in the next few days, or if you have a problem that you think is interesting enough and not uh, easy enough for ChatGPT to solve, then you can ask me. And I will go to ChatGPT to check first. <laughs> All right, so uh, I have two email addresses and they are there, but uh, uh, the institutional one is the one between brackets, uh, is the slower one because it feeds the other one. So if you want to have a quick, uh, hold, quick hold of me, just use the Gmail account, okay? All right. Uh, yeah, I also wrote a book that is relevant, relevant to these lectures. If you care to have a look, uh, the book is, uh, uh, available for free. I didn't get rich with it. I think it sold 450 copies or something, but I had fun writing it. It's a book about the sociology of the CDF experiment, a large collaboration back then, but now we have larger ones. And uh, I told a few stories that have to do with the analysis of the data that led to the discovery of the top quark in 1995 uh, by the CDF and the zero experiments at the Tevatron Collider. And uh, the discovery, the search for new physics that ensued afterwards. And there's a lot to learn in the history of past experiments, especially about statistics and the statistical handling of large data sets and uh, the inference that you can make and the wrong inference that you can make. Because you can do things right in one way and you can do things wrong in many, many ways. Okay. Uh, well, this is a slide about the mode collaboration. That's, but I want now to talk about you, because this course covers material which I find of, of, of general interest, but I would like to know what is your background, where do you come from? Okay, this is a school for machine learning and statistics for high energy physics, but I bet some of you have gotten here from other paths. And I would like to know what your background is. So how do we do that? Uh, uh, how many, first of all, are you, most of you are, I suspect, uh, base, uh, PhD students, but uh, how many bachelor students are here or master students? One, okay. Two, okay. Mostly PhD, how many PhDs? Okay, mostly PhDs. And uh, so we got that right. And uh, how many are in experimental particle physics? About half, half right. And uh, how many are in theory, theoretical particle physics? All right, thank you. 
and how many to phenomenology, which is a little bit at the crossroads. Okay, well, a mixed lot, very good. Um, astroparticle physicists, are there any? A few, okay, good. It's a flourishing field of uh, science. Uh, well, it has been for a while now, but uh, the bigger discoveries are made there nowadays. And uh, are there nuclear physicists around? None. Okay, interesting. Uh, and uh, any of you study neutrino physics? Okay, there's a, actually a few. Very good. Okay, yeah. There will be one example later on, probably tomorrow we'll get to it, that is based on a neutrino physics experiment. Sorry, I missed one slide. Okay, but I guess uh, anybody that uh, is a strange uh, Beast, okay, you are not fitting any of that. Are you a mathematician? What are you? What? Oh, you are a cosmologist. Okay, very good. <laughs> Excellent. So we have uh, a little bit of everything. Um, and of course, okay, the, the material that I want to present to you in these slides is fixed, but uh, um, it will help me if, uh, if, uh, I suspect that uh, most of the questions will be answered with a yes. But how many of you know what a Taylor series is? Okay, good. <laughs> how many know what is an expectation value? Okay, good. How many of you know what is the central limit theorem? Very good. How many of you know what is a systematic uncertainty? Okay. And uh, how many of you know Bayes' theorem? Okay. And how many of you know all of the above? Okay, we don't, you know, we don't need to brag. I, I, got, I got the message, yes. So I think we can deal with uh, the kind of stuff that I'm going to present today. So the content of today's lectures, today we'll go through um, four and a half hours if my voice holds up, because that's, that's the concern. I've never spoken so long. Well, I do, but uh, then, then I, I regret it. So um, the first thing I want to touch basis with you on is how knowing the basic statistics distributions, you know, the probability density functions that you draw data from, how knowing the properties of those functions saves us from horrible pitfalls. That is uh, for a reason that this, this topic is the very first that you find in all textbooks of statistics, uh, at least practical statistics. And we'll see a couple of examples of that. And then we will, yes, go through the nuts and bolts of error propagation. And uh, I will make a point because some things are overlooked. Uh, it's uh, worthwhile to look at them, although you are a knowledgeable uh, audience. And uh, we will deal with estimators today. Estimators, the things that we use to get uh, estimates of physics quantities. And uh, these are very important in not only knowing their properties, but being able to pick the correct one is is really what makes the difference between a good physicist and a very good physicist, in my opinion, because you can uh, have the same data set and by choosing the right way to extract information from the data set, you can do a better job than the other guy, okay? And get a smaller uncertainty bar. So we'll look at the chi-squared method and we look at the maximum likelihood, of course, and there are also a couple of exercises that I offer to you, then maybe we won't have time to look through that, but uh, well, we, we, we at least will try. And uh, yes, knowing the properties of estimators allows you to avoid uh, some problems, and we'll see some of them. Again, fully fo focusing on uh, not just what is good practice, but uh, what can happen if, if you don't follow the correct path. Because you know, statistics 
is uh, not an exact science in the sense that uh, it gives you different answers to the same question depending on the details of the way that you formulate the question. Yes, it is an exact science. It is based on mathematics. But, um, but in the practice of statistics, it, it, you, you encounter subtleties. And uh, so you have to be very diligent in deciding exactly how to interrogate the data. Because they will speak. But the way they will speak might lead you astray, might deceive you if you don't exactly ask the correct question. Okay? And it is important also when you publish a result to explicitly write exactly what you ask for your data. Right? Uh, okay. So we'll talk about the covariance matrix and the error level ellipse because these are two, two things, two of the, the tools that actually allow us to extract this information from estimators. We will look at uh, a comparison of estimators in a case where two of the three that we will see are biased. Uh, and, uh, and that will teach us a few things. And I think if we go through all of this today, uh, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, I have two suggestions for you. One of them is to interrupt me, please. Please do. Don't let me finish a sentence if you don't understand the previous one, okay? And, uh, and don't be afraid if the question is silly. We all ask silly questions, but uh, actually those that don't are the ones that remain silly for all their life. Okay? So please ask questions. I remember when I was in CDF, I, I was uh, a fresh new convener of a, a jet energy reconstruction group. And I was very proud of, I was a fresh uh, uh, postdoc. And I had uh, colleagues, uh, there was a co-convener, and we start discussing with some other physicists, and they start uh, discussing uh, the, uh, the Jimmy corrections. And I don't know what the Jimmy corrections are. And uh, they start discussing this, and, and I thought, OK, they will discuss this, and then we'll move to some other topic. And then, no, the discussion is all about this, and the details of it, and I don't know anything for one and a half hours of discussion. And, I'm afraid to ask because it has already been 10 minutes that they discussed the Jimmy correction. And I cannot say, what are the Jimmy corrections? I should have asked the first moment, right? And then I felt very sorry for that, for not having asked, <laughs> OK? So please do. Please ask questions as soon as they come up to your mind. And there, there's, there is some maths in these lectures. Don't, uh, uh, I don't expect to go through the details of all of it, but okay, we will go through a little bit of it in some cases because it's good. There are some uh, there are some cases when uh, uh, things are left for computer code. So you have a problem, you call a certain library, and it does it for you. That's actually it's good. To at least once in your life to do some maths with paper and pencil, okay? And to actually solve a likelihood function with your hands, with your bare hands, and find the results without running Minuit, or invert the covariance matrix and find the eigenvalues. And this stuff will help you because it lets you see how actually things work. Okay, there will be a couple of examples of uh, getting hands dirty with actually the practical calculations. Uh, well, okay, so sometimes I will go fast uh, and maybe skip uh, something that I find obvious, but it isn't, so please stop me, okay? Um, yeah. Uh, mainly tomorrow, we will also do some practical exercises with uh, the root computer program. But OK, you can do most things with C++ or whatever you want. But uh, we, will, we will have some examples. And there is some code that you can download from that website uh, um, about examples and exercises with root macros, C++ uh, snippets. Okay. Um, 
So, okay, if you haven't done so, you should install the root program in your laptop. Um, and uh, root can be run in interpreter mode. So it's a set of C++ commands and it can just execute them on the go, but it's better if you compile the code before because it gets much faster. And uh, there are some tricks to install that on a Windows-based uh, machine. I think root has discontinued use of uh, uh, releases for Windows after version 5 or 34 or something. So the latest, the la latest one that there is, and I think it's 15 years old or something, but it still works. I use it. Uh, so, but okay, if you have Linux, you should use root 6, uh, whatever is the latest, greatest. Um, yeah, this is for, for Windows. You have to create this bat file, file which points to a Visual Studio 11, which you also have to download. That will allow you to, to compile the code. Um, yeah. And that is how you load and uh, run your macros. Um, so here are a few... Uh, a few of the macros that uh, we'll go through tomorrow, so don't, don't bother writing this down. Uh, at the end of these lectures, I will make sure that you have a pointer to these slides and you can download them. Actually, they are already there in that link, but I'll give you the name. And this is stuff mostly for tomorrow. So, okay, let's get to it. <clears throat> uh, to be a good physicist, we, know, we need to understand statistics. And uh, I made the point, uh, I, uh, and, uh, and that is why, because our results are inconclusive most of the times. If, if, if you are searching for a new resonance, a particle in a mass distribution, and you see a large bump, it passes the interocular stress test. It means that it hits you between the eyes. You know that it is there, right? You, you, have see, you see it. You don't need to run a statistical test to, to get the significance. When Carlo Rubbia presented the discovery of the W and Z bosons in 1983 in a seminar at CERN, he didn't do any statistical tests. First of all, because he was Carlo Rubbia, and second, because the data was unmistakable. Uh, you, you, you saw that he had the signal, he had the uh, very clean events, not even many, but uh, there was no background, it was clear. But we are almost never in that luxurious situation. We almost always are on the verge of discovery. We have two sigma, we have three sigma, three and a half sigmas. We have to convince our peer that what we see is a new effect, a new phenomenon. These things are not coming out uh, uh, so often. So people are skeptical, and you have to be very careful. So we have to use statistics, and statistics is the language by means of which we can uh, best communicate exactly the power of our uh, data. Yeah, and uh, I already said this as well. You can, uh, you can get better results than your colleagues, other things being equal if you can use uh, statistical tools in the optimal way. There are a number of, uh, of uh, um, ways to, to actually assess that. In statistics, we speak, for instance, of the best estimator, the uniformly uh, uh, minimum variance unbiased estimator, the UMVU. How many of you did the year before of the UMVU? Ah, not many, so good. I have something for you. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, statistics uh, actually focuses on this, on things that uh, are the best possible inference, the least biased estimators, the least variance, because we want to get as good results as possible. We also said that it's very easy to draw wrong inferences from your data if you lack uh, precise knowledge about some of the details of the statistical problems that you have to face. Um, 
yeah, and we also said that uh, foundational statistics plays a role because the question you ask has a bearing on the answer that you get. Um, yeah, and it's not always trivial to decide. Uh, but there is another slant to it, which is there to my heart, and that is that we are sometimes, uh, maybe not uh, as you get out of this door today, but at some point you start doing research and uh, maybe you do something that is of interest and uh, maybe you get uh, the phone call from a reporter who wants to speak about your results. And you have to be very careful because as scientists, I think we have a We must be committed to uh, propagate the results of our work correctly. That is, uh, society pays for our salaries. Uh, it pays my, my salary uh, for doing research. And this is taxpayers' money. And uh, we want to give back to society what we, what we, the product of our studies. We don't want to keep it to our, ourselves. It's not like they paid us to do research for our own sake. We do it for the community, okay? So you have a responsibility with the community to propagate the results in the correct way. And this today is very, very difficult because there is so much pollution in the way information is processed and propagated in the media. And so you have to be careful on how you present your results to a lay person. So you have to dump down things in a way that is understandable while keeping it correct. This is very difficult, okay? And uh, so you hear people doing, uh, uh, doing things the wrong way and uh, doing probability inversion statements. Uh, when you start talking about the probability of the data under some hypothesis and actually what you propagate is the probability of the hypothesis given the data, which you don't do. We don't do that. We speak of the probability of the data given an hypothesis because we don't do the full chain. We don't go to the final product. At least if you are a frequentist, we'll touch on this subject probably towards the end of these lectures. We, uh, we speak of the probability of the data, okay? Because hypothesis, well, what is the probability that the photon has a mass zero? Is it one? Is it less than one? It's arguable, right? I mean, we don't speak of the probability of a parameter of physics of nature having a precise value or another one. It has a value and it, that, it, that is it. But Bayesian statistics is extremely powerful and, uh, and uh, we cannot ignore it. So many scientists actually use Bayesian statistics. But I think in fundamental science, in particle physics, we stick with, we prefer to stick with uh, frequentist statistics uh, for a reason or two. Probably we'll get to that at some point. Anyways, um, yeah, and who talks bad things bad? If you take a habit of uh, sloppy jargon, you'll, you'll, you'll end up drifting away, <laughs> okay? We will make some examples of that. And uh, yeah, I will focus on uh, wrong inference due to insufficient knowledge also a little bit uh, later. Yeah, uh, I have a list, I've compiled a list of uh, statements that I heard at conferences from colleagues or just uh, in physics talks around. And, uh, and, uh, and they are statements that are wrong, that are misstated that uh, uh, omit, uh, omit important detail that are other, anyways that, that in some way betray that uh, the statistics behind it is wrong. So one guy, or wrong, or even just uh, silly. This one is silly. The measurement is quoted as 0 0.12 plus or minus 0 0.03. So the effect is a 41 sigma proof of a non-null value. I won't comment on this. We'll probably get to that at the end of the lectures, okay? But um, this guy is uh, talking about 41 sigma. Do you know what is a p-value corresponding to 40 sigma? Off the top of your head. Where's a guess? 
you know that the number of standard deviations, units of the Gaussian distribution, is as a one-to-one -one correspondence to a p-value, the tail probability, the integral of the Gaussian after that number of sigmas. 40 sig the, the Gaussian is a very, very fastly decaying distribution. It doesn't have fat tails. By the time you go to 40 sigma, the p-value is of the order of 10 to the minus 300 or something. So there are more atoms in the universe that, <laughs> than the probability of picking one is that, is that one. So no, you cannot speak of 40 sigma. That is certainly a systematic effect. That is not a statistic effect. So you can, you have to be careful. You, uh, uh, sigma, number of sigma counting is something that is used to, just as a shortcut, right? Because we speak of uh, gigabytes rather than say 10 to the nine bytes, we speak of nanometers, we take shortcuts uh, by language. And so we talk about sigmas to avoid saying 0 0.00000297, which is a five sigma point. Uh, so it's a mathematical map, but we don't go to 40 sigma for, for God's sake, okay? All right, Th that guy didn't know what he was talking about. It was just dividing 0 0.12 by 0 0.003. That is his way. So the probability that there is no resonance given the observed data is 10 to the minus 4. Probability inversion statement. Red flag. Don't do that. I expected 100 plus or minus 10 events from backgrounds. I saw 130. The probability that these 130 events are all backgrounds is just 0 0.0017, three sigma effect. Speaking of probability of the of the hypothesis, the cross section is measured to be 1.5 plus or minus 0 0.5 picobands. So this is a three sigma evidence of the process. Do you know what is wrong with this? Does anybody have a clue? So you measure something. Uh, you measure zero if there is no process. You measure something larger than zero. You measure a rate, so you measure a cross section, and you give an uncertainty bar to the cross section, and the uncertainty bar is three sigma away from zero. Three sigma in the sense that it is 0 0.5 and the value is 1.5. So is this three sigma by default because just is the probability corresponding to that 1.7, 10 to the minus three? Does anybody know what might be wrong in this? See, when I say 1.5 plus or minus 0 0.5, am I telling you that that, uh, that uncertainty I put there is what? You have all reasons to believe that that is a 68.3% uh, confidence level around the uncertainty, that around the central value. But did I tell you that that is a statistical uncertainty? No. It could be a systematic uncertainty. It could be a luminosity error. I could have measured 1.5 picobands with a million events, which have a res relative statistical uncertainty of 10 to the minus 3. And so that would be a thousand sigma experiment, as the other guy was saying, right? So that 0.5 doesn't allow you to say that you are three sigma away from zero. It might be a million sigma away from zero. So all of these things are wrong, uh, and betray, they betray wrong thinking behind it. I tuned the selection of my cut and count analysis by maximizing the signal over the square root of the background. So it is optimized for discovery. We'll get to that in a moment. The upper 95% limit is taken as the point where the cumulative of the likelihood function reaches the value of 0.95. Do you integrate the likelihood? Is it a PDF? No, the likelihood is not a PDF. You cannot integrate it. Okay? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to integrate the likelihood function. Please remember that. I opened the box, and the event count was three sigma below the standard model expectation. Damn it, I had to redo it. There has to be a mistake somewhere. So I changed the background estimating procedure, and now the measurement is within one sigma. I won't tell you what is wrong in this, but it's, uh, it's 
strange looking procedure, isn't it? So all of this is uh, just a potpourri of things that are wrong or misstated or inconsistent or they betray wrong thinking behind them, okay? So let's go straight uh, before we deal with the main topic of today, which is estimators in fact. Let's talk about the signal over the square root of the background because this is very relevant for what we do. We do counting experiments in particle physics and we do counting experiments in astroparticle physics and neutrino physics. And so, for instance, in a, you, you may have a gamma, a nice uh, gamma ray telescope that looks at the sky and there is a gamma ray emitter, the Crab Nebula. M1, Messier 1. And, uh, and that is a standard candle in the sky. It uh, has a very constant rate of photons that come in. So you can tune your efficiency and whatever by just pointing your telescope at it. And what you do in this kind of experiments, you count events, you count photons, you count collisions that produce a Higgs boson. You collect uh, a number statistic that tells you the rate of a Poisson process. Events that come in at a fixed rate uh, and, that, and they are uncorrelated with one another constitute a Poisson process. So we do science, a lot of science with this kind of setup where for instance here this telescope saw two gamma rays in an hour of observation, it has uh, been tuned to, and uh, it was found to have 33% efficiency. And we can also estimate the background from sources by just pointing away from the source, the telescope you count for some time, its background. Then you point it at the source and you get also the signal in, on top of the background. So you can estimate the background by the offside, the sideband if you want. And so you can subtract it, and so you have one event per hour, 33% efficiency. The flux is three events per hour. <coughs> so this is the kind of counting experiments that we do. And typically what people do is uh, to look at the signal with the square root of background because uh, you have a prediction for the background, and that is a Poisson process. And the Poisson has this property, we'll see it in a moment, that the variance is equal to the mean. So the variance of this number is equal to the number itself. So when you observe some events that are larger than the expected background, well, you can make some inference uh, about the possible existence of some extra signal on top of the background. And how do you determine this signal? By subtracting the background. And you subtract something, which has an uncertainty, and the uncertainty is equal to square root of the expectation because of what I just said. So if you have a certain signal present, the mean value of the observed, well, the expectation value of the observed uh, counts so should be equal to the background plus the signal. But if you have no background, uh, sorry, if you have no signal, then you should, uh, on average, expect to see the number of background that you have estimated. So since this comes with the uncertainty, which is the square root of the background itself, then the signal over the square root of the background tells you how good you are off. So this is, uh, this is uh, what you get. Uh, let's forget systematic uncertainties because they complicate the matter a little bit, not much, but random events that come in at a fixed rate constitute a Poisson process. So this background will be affected by this variation and therefore you maximize the signal, the expected signal which you can get by a simulation or something divided by the expected background uh, uh, under square root. And this uh, should be proportional to your significance, to the significance of an excess of signal over background. So this is, this is quite, quite uh, reasonable, it doesn't have anything wrong with it. 
the problem though is that this, this is typically applied to cases where the number of events involved is small. For what we already said, right, that we are doing statistics at few events because otherwise we don't do statistics. And then there is a problem because uh, although it is true that the variance uh, of, uh, of a Poisson process of mean mu is mu, you have to be careful in how you, how you use this. Uh, and uh, so we optimize S over square root of B, or if you are, uh, sorry, S over square root of B plus S, this is a correction you can put at the denominator. There's a dash thing here, uh, a divide sign here. Uh, and we do this uh, even when uh, we are expecting to see a small number of entries. And this uh, is problematic. So let's take uh, the plunge into a one specific case, which comes from the CMS experiment, where there was an analysis I was reviewing, which at uh, pre-selection stage, so these guys were looking for a certain signal, and they expected to see eight signal events from Monte Carlo simulation and one, only one background. So this was a very good uh, uh, signal-rich uh, region that they had isolated, right? And the signal over square root of background is eight in this case. And S over B plus S uh, uh, square, uh, square root, 0 0.89. So these are two figures of merit. They don't mean anything by themselves, but they mean anything if you compare them to something else. So uh, this person was uh, looking at the data, their, the distributions, uh, I don't know, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps this, uh, this person was plotting a distribution of some kinematic quantity for the signal, and he was noticing that the expected background had a different distribution. And so this is after the preselection. So wait, ah, if I make a cut here or something like that, I can select uh, a signal rich, even a richer signal, a region more, more rich in signal. So the person was proposing to do this additional selection cut, which was bringing it down to an expected 4.8 signal and 0 0.2 background events. It was reducing the background further by a factor of five. So this was considered a good thing. And in fact, if you plug in the numbers, the Q values, S over square root of B, goes up to 10.7. Good, so I should take it, right? So is it a good idea? Well, we are doing things correctly. We are optimizing S over square root of B. Well, if you do the math, what you should actually ask yourself is not what is the value of Q, because I'm not doing anything with Q in itself. What you're doing when you want to extract the significance of a signal is getting the p-value. And so you do a pool of pseudo experiments and you, what, what you extract is the median of the p-value. Why the median? Because you want to know at least 50% of the times I get a p-value larger than this or smaller than this. Yeah, I want a small p-value because I want a large statistical significant effect. So I poll my data, I do pseudo experiments, and I look at the median of the p-value, and I look what, what that p-value is because that tells me 50% of the times you're going to do a, C, a, a, a measurement which has a p-value smaller than five sigma or something like that. So you extract this information. And the median of the background only p value distribution for observing eight plus one, nine events at pre selection level is uh, 10 to the minus six, pretty good, almost five sigma significance. But this is twice smaller, so better, than the median p value for observing 4.8 plus or minus 0 0.2 after the pre selection, after the selection. So, you see that uh, following the S over square root of background rule hasn't helped us at all. And if we take the extra cut, we pay a price. We worsen our discovery significance, uh, reach, or whatever you want to call it, by a factor of 2.5.
So uh, this is just a stupid, silly example, but it's a practical life in a large experiment <laughs> because people come in and say, oh, they told me that I should optimize by S over square root of B, and that's what I do, and they still do. I'm presently the ARC chair of a CMS analysis, and they are doing it this way, and uh, <laughs> when I look at the number, wait a minute, these numbers are small. And you optimize the S over square root of B. Yes, but you know there's many signal regions, so we have to automate the procedure. Yes, but you, you just change that S over square root of B into another formula, which is still fitting into one line, and you get the correct result. Please do it, right? Oh, but we have to rerun all the data. <laughs> yes, you have to rerun all the data. <laughs> OK. So if you want a, a quick and dirty answer, please use this stupid formula. Oh, but there are even better ones, OK? But they are more accurate because they don't get screwed up when you get to very small number of entries. Because why does that Poisson approximation significance formula do? It, it is perfect when you have uh, 500 events. Because the Poisson turns into the Gaussian distribution when the number of uh, the mean is large. But when the numbers are small, the Poisson becomes uh, clumpy. It's a discrete probability density. Uh, and, uh, and so the, 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 this, uh, the fact that its variance has a certain value doesn't, doesn't guarantee you that uh, you will get uh, this, uh, these properties of, uh, of translating uh, that, uh, that uh, deviation into a significance level. So the bottom line is that, in general, optimization is a word used recklessly, OK? And the full optimization is almost never seen in a high energy physics analysis because they are so damn hard, OK? In fact, that mode collaboration I was telling you about is trying to do precisely that. So but when you can, if you can, you will not be able to. But if you at all can, please try at least to optimize on the final result that you are for, and not on intermediate steps. That produces a misalignment, OK? If you can, use the median null hypothesis p-value. The null hypothesis is the one which doesn't include the new physics process that you're looking for. OK, so uh, every textbook contains uh, a lot of discussion of basic statistical distributions for a good reason or two. So you all know what a Gaussian distribution is, what a Poisson distribution is, what an exponential is, a uniform, a binomial, and multinomial distribution, what they are. If you don't, well, uh, I would be happy to explain, but we would be wasting our time because I would not be telling you anything that uh, you don't find in any textbook, OK? Uh, I will try to keep you on board in the sense that when we encounter this distribution, I will try to be analytic and, uh, and, not, uh, and, and not leave you behind. But there are many more distributions, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. If you do statistics, uh, well, if you always do counting experiments, you will only need the Poisson, the Gaussian, little else, right? But if you do various things, uh, you encounter many of these. The chi-square distribution is certainly one you will know, need to know. Maybe you won't need the compound Poisson, but maybe you will. The log normal distribution, the gamma, the beta, the Cauchy distribution, well, that is very important for physics, right? Resonances are bright Wigner or Lorentzian or Cauchy distributions. The Laplace, we will encounter the Laplace. The Fischer's Nedecor, we will encounter that as well. And there are many others that are important. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so it's important not only to know that they exist, but also to understand what you might uh, do wrong if you mistake one for the other. So let's look at the Poisson distribution. I think uh, one of the best known distributions by physicists. You know, it's a discrete distribution. 
it is only defined at integer values for a reason that it describes the probability mass of observing exactly a certain number of events n when the process comes in at the rate mu. And that is mu to the n e to the minus mu divided by factorial of n. As we said, the expectation value, which I haven't defined, but I'll define it in a slide later on, a Poisson with mean mu is exactly mu. So if you integrate this, you get, uh, you get the expectation value is mu. So a Poisson of mean uh, eight, uh, eight is uh, the expectation value of the distribution. And uh, the person describes the probability of getting exactly n events in a given time if these occur independently and randomly at constant rate, okay? And uh, the binomial is a limiting case of the, 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 the Poisson is a limiting case of the binomial distribution when the probability becomes small when n goes to infinity. All right, you know all of these facts. And uh, since we are at that, the binomial distribution is also quite common. And that describes the probability of obtaining exactly k successes when you do trials you try for, uh, to see if a track uh, passes uh, uh, your selection, uh, and uh, so you have a certain efficiency of uh, seeing the track in your detector. So it's successes over failures, okay? And the distribution is the combinatorial factor n over k times p to the k times one minus p to the n minus k. And uh, what is the expectation value of the binomial? Who knows it? I'm sure many of you know, but you don't uh, raise your hand because you're shy. Okay, it's easy, come on, because you have a probability P and uh, the number of trials is N, so the expectation value must be N times P, okay? And the variance of the binomial is N times P times one minus P. So when you actually try to estimate the uncertainty on an efficiency value, which is, uh, uh, you know, k divided by n, success is divided by trials, the uncertainty you attach to it might be what uh, is called the walled uh, interval. The walled interval is basically <clears throat> n times k over n, times one minus k over n. Why? Because I'm substituting the true probability of the binomial, the parameter of the binomial, with its observed value, k over n. But beware of that, because one thing is the true parameter of a distribution, a different thing is your estimate of that. So when you substitute a true value with an estimate of the true value, you are messing up things a little bit, and you are allowed to do that, but you have to be careful and you, know, you have to know that you're doing it, okay? So the walled interval, which is estimating the variance of the binomial by substituting the unknown probability with the known estimate of the probability, has very bad coverage properties. And we will see exactly what the coverage of the walled interval is probably tomorrow. As we said already, the binomial distribution converts to the Poisson. And then let's have another shot at it. I'm not continuing with all the distributions that are on Earth, be, be rest assured, okay? <laughs> we are moving on. But I want to tell you about the compound Poisson distribution for a reason. The compound Poisson describes the sum of n Poisson variables. But each of these n Poisson variables is as a certain mean. But n itself is sampled as a Poisson variable, which has a mean lambda. So you have a certain number of Poissons, and you add them together, but uh, each of them has a certain mean. 
and you estimate it with this double sum. Okay, you have a Poisson process of mean lambda that determines the number of uh, n, and then you have uh, <coughs> n mu as the second variable of the second term. So, why do we care about the compound Poisson? Because it has an expectation value which, again, we could have figured it out, lambda times mu, okay? Two Poisson processes summed one by the other, the mean is lambda mu. But the variance is lambda mu times one plus mu. Well, it, it takes uh, a funny half hour of calculations to get this, but uh, you can do it at home to convince yourself of that. So why is this relevant? Because it is uh, a term you would expect times something more, okay? So uh, the point I will make is that the compound Poisson distribution is relevant for our science and not knowing that it exists, as I bet most of you didn't know it existed, because that is typically what happens with the people at my lectures. Typical fraction of people who knew the Poisson, the compound Poisson is five to 10%. Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, if you don't know that it exists, uh, you can run into a problem. So I, I, have, uh, <laughs> I have preempted this question, but I don't even want to ask. ask. So first, let me ask you to do this exercise if you want. So you can, uh, if you go to your office every day, uh, you will do most likely the same route from home. And you can count the people you meet, okay? And one day you meet 15 people, the next 30, the next 12. So the number of people that you cross in the street at the same time in the day, well, there are many systematic effects, but it's a number that comes in with a constant rate. It's random, right? So is it a Poisson number? Well, you can compute the sample mean and the variance of the data that you've got. And to ask yourself if they come from a Poisson distribution, you can do a statistical test. You can invent a statistical test for a Poisson and it's very easy. What is the most important property of the Poisson distribution that I just told you about? Who wants to have a shot? What? Yes, so you use that. You estimate the variance of your data, you estimate the mean of your data, and you check if they are equal, okay? Well, one possibility. Yeah. We will discuss hypothesis tests later on, but this is certainly a good recipe for testing for the Poisson. One thing we will mention on Thursday is that there is no silver bullet for statistical tests. It depends what you are comparing the Poisson with whether this is the right test that you want to use, okay? But we'll get to that. Um, but okay, with enough data, you will find that that is not a Poisson distribution. And uh, you will have to ask yourself what distribution, what statistical distribution approximates your data better than that. It's a silly example, but you can try it if you want. Now, let's look at the... Uh, um, a practical exercise that you can also try. Imagine you are given a very small amount of a fast decaying radioisotope and you have a particle counter. And you set out to measure the activity of this substance in counts per minute. And you record the counts in each minute. And then, next day you come back to take some more data and you get these further 10 readings. Okay, so, all right, are the data consistent with coming from a Poisson distribution? Or what other distribution could they be coming from? And what statistical test could you invent to determine the most likely hypothesis? I let you think over this and then maybe we can discuss uh, uh, over a cup of tea. This afternoon or later. So, 
But really, what I wanted to get at is this. Is this paper that was published on the prestigious physical review letters in 1969 by these two guys, which I think were chemists or something, I don't know, but they had access to, uh, to data from an atmospheric balloon that was sent in the stratosphere with uh, a bubble chamber. A bubble chamber records uh, the passage of charged particles. And charged particles leave tracks that depend on processes that have to do with the ionizations that these particles produce in, in the gas. And these bubbles that form, you can actually count the number of bubbles in these uh, uh, photographic emulsions. And uh, these guys observed four tracks in a Wilson chamber, which had very small ionization. And you know, in 1964, there was this guy called Murray Gelman and another guy called George Zweig, who had hypothesized that, that all of the mass of hadrons that had been discovered uh, until then at particle accelerators, and a few others that were discovered later, could fit in a very elegant and uh, simple uh, representation uh, if made of quarks, or anyways, aces, I, how George Zweig called them. By the way, I met George Zweig, and uh, he's a great guy, but uh, he was uh, prevented from publishing uh, his paper by, uh, by Ho, who was uh, the, the, the director at CERN back then, because uh, um, because uh, George Zweig uh, uh, was a member of an American institution and uh, for funding reasons had to publish his paper on an American journal and how didn't want to hear about it. So he basically prevented George Zweig to having access to the secretary who would typeset his article. And he couldn't publish his paper, which was actually coming at the same time of uh, Murray Gelman's article on quarks. So they deserve equal credit for the discovery of quarks and uh, the SU3 structure of, uh, which was later called the Eightfold Way along uh, the terminology used by Murray Gelman. Anyways, the question whether quarks were mathematical entities or real bodies was very much the topic in 1969. And these guys come up with a claim that Atmospheric showers produce quarks that leave tracks in bubble chambers. And these tracks ionize less because they have two thirds or one third of electric charge. The ionization goes with the square of the electric charge and so on. So after this, they published this paper and uh, they show the track which uh, could not be anything but a fractionary charged particle because after all, it has a fourth of the bubbles of the others. So it produced, well, not a fourth, a little bit more. It produced 110 droplets per unit path length against an expectation of 229, which is the, the mean of the total number of tracks that they had observed. Do you see anything procedurally strange in this? Well, I see many things. So the first thing is that, I mean, you're using the data to get your mean, but then you're also using the extreme value as uh, something you want to uh, place uh, some uh, inference on. And there has to be a trial factor in here somewhere, right? You, you are, you are handpicking here as an odd track. Yes, there's always an odd track, right? Anyways, what is the probability? Yeah, I think it, it, that, that was the whole sample mean, yes. So that already is a bias. But it's not even the worst of the things that these guys did. <coughs> so, uh, we want to estimate the probability to observe this phenomenon. 
that you would get 110 when the mean is 229, a Poisson process of mean 29, 229 as a, a, a variance on 229, and the, 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 the sigma of 229 is what? 15.1, right? So you are measuring 110 when the mean is 229 plus or minus 15. You are many sigmas away. This was the reasoning. And note that if you are strongly in nuclear physics and in thermodynamics, because you have done your studies correctly, you may know that the scattering interaction of a charged particle produces on average four droplets, not one. That's the average. So one scattering, two bubbles. Another scattering, six bubbles, okay, so on. But that will not help you if you don't know statistics enough. The scattering and the droplet formation are independent for some processes, two processes, <clears throat> all right? So probably the fact that I presented the compound Poisson a slide earlier should give it away, right? Uh, anyways, what is the significance that this guy is extracted? If it is a single Poisson process, which process we are dealing with, the mu of 229, we should evaluate, uh, in a frequentist sense, the probability of observing a phenomenon at least as extreme as the one that we have seen. So we integrate from 0 to 110 to get the probability. This distribution is normalized to 1, so we take a part of it and we get the sum 10 to the minus 18. It's a really, really strange and odd phenomenon, right? But okay, but there is a trial factor there because we observed 50,000 tracks. And uh, seeing at least one track with a probability less than this value has more than a single chance of occurring because you have 50,000 tracks. And you have to correct for this trial factor. <coughs> well, you get. Uh, up by a factor of 10 to the 5, but it's still 10 to the minus 13 is what, uh, 8, 9 sigma, right? So it's uh, definitely in observation level territory. But it's wrong because you don't have to do with a Poisson process. You have to do with a compound Poisson process where you have scattering, which is a Poisson process, and you have droplet formation, which is a Poisson process. So you should actually think it this way. The product of lambda and mu, the expectation value of the number of droplets per unit path length is 229, but mu is four, the number of droplets per scatter. So you should rather compute this sum, which is five, 10 to the minus five. And after you correct for the trails factor, the probability of seeing at least one such track is 92%. So this guy is published on physics review letters of having observed the fractionary charges because they did their statistics wrong by a factor of 10 to the minor, 10 to the 13. So if you know a paper that gets a number wrong by more than 10 to the 13, please let me know. I would like to know it. But this is certainly a good example of something gone very, very wrong, okay? All right, so I, get, I, I guess you get the point. The bottom line is that you may know your detector and the underlying physics as well as you know your ass, but only knowledge of basic statistics prevents you from fooling yourself. Okay. And uh, I think before the break, we can go through these statistical distributions of which I took the pains of putting for you a little bit of fun facts together. This is just a, a quick summary. You have the Gaussian, its expression, the mean is mu, the variance is sigma squared. Uh, central limit theorem uh, applies to a lot of different uh, phenomena. The sum of uh, 
different uh, many small uh, uh, ad ad additions becomes Gaussian very, very, very quickly. We will see a couple of actual practical examples. One will be the opera experiment. Uh, there will be a couple of examples later on where we will have to deal with the fact that distributions that are not Gaussian become Gaussian because of the sum of many different smearings. Okay, so it is extremely important as a distribution, as a limiting case, and the, because in practice, many things that would not be Gaussian become Gaussian because of smearings. The exponential, okay, you know it. The variance of the exponential is tau squared. Nothing fun about it. The uniform distribution is, is something that uh, <coughs> is uniform. But it can be uniform in an interval A, B, right? So it's a probability density function is as much as this uh, is uh, normalized to be B minus A, right? because you want its integral to be one, but that's the only thing you need to have. The rest is that it is just a constant probability. And it has its own variance. One over square root of 12 is a number you should remember, and if you have been into detector physics and you build the silicon strip detectors, they have a pitch of 50 microns. 50 microns, what is the resolution on single hits? 50 divided by square root of 12, because there's a uniform probability that they hit one point or the next in a strip detector. So knowing these things, uh, having them on the tip of your tongue uh, helps, okay? The Poisson, we discussed it. The binomial, we discussed it. The chi-square distribution, kind of a complicated formula. I never remember this formula. I don't need to remember it. You have tools that compute the chi-square, or if you want computing the chi-square, is easy, but the probability density function is this. And the mean is n, and the variance is 2n. What does it mean that the mean is n? If you have a chi-square with n degrees of freedom, on average, you divide by n to get a number that is close to 1. But then the width will depend on 2n, so you have to be careful. And then our beloved Cauchy distribution, it has these funny properties that the mean is undefined. What, wait, undefined? I see the peak, it's there. Yes, but you cannot mathematically compute the mean of the distribution, okay, it diverges. And uh, it's actually, can, cannot be computed, and the, the variance of the Cauchy is infinite. But I see that it has a certain width. The particle width is, you know, how wide this uh, Lorentzian distribution is, yes, but Mathematically, it's infinite. I think it's a good time to stop, but I would like to ask you if you have uh, questions or perplexities or what, what questions you have about what you just saw. Now, I know that when we go out of that door, I will have at least two or three of you coming at me and asking me questions. And I won't answer, please ask now, so that all the others can benefit from it, okay? Okay, one question. S upon B, and S upon root B, and S upon S under root S plus B. So why these were like different? Good question, yes, I didn't go into that. So, um, <clears throat> we were saying that uh, if we have a certain signal on top of some background, <coughs> the expectation value uh, that we should see is the sum of the two, right? And so I expect, let's have a histogram, I expect a certain number of background events. And uh, in fact, I observe a different number because there might be an addition from an unknown signal S. So, so what we do is uh, we say, okay, the background has a certain uncertainty associated to it, which is square root of B. And so I do, the signal is uh, away from the background by an amount which is equal to the signal itself in units of the square root of the background. So 
this distance is one, two, three, four sigma, say, okay? So that is the way I compute my Q value. But if you want to be a little bit smarter, you can say yes, but uh, the signal has also its own Poisson uncertainty. So sometimes I observe S, sometimes I observe S plus or minus square root of S. So actually I can do, I can take this as a Poisson variable or mean S plus B. And this as, a, as, a, as an uncertainty which is square root of S plus B. And so the distance of this point from this evaluated with this metric is S over square root of S plus B. So there's nothing magical about it. It's just a number, okay? It's not much better than the other one. It's just a correction that some people like to put. But nothing really big. One was under uh, one, like 0 0.97, and one value was too high, so. Yeah, you don't have to compare one to the other, but you can compare those values separately in different conditions, after one cut, after two cuts, etc. But so you will just choose one, one of the two. You don't compare them. They, they are telling you a different story. They ask different questions to the data. And there was one thing like you calculate only B, when, B only, like background only P value. Why was that? And the background only P value is uh, because you are <coughs> looking for a new physics process and uh, you have the standard model, right? So your background is the standard model and uh, that is your null hypothesis. And so when you look at some data and you say, uh, okay, how this, do these data conform to the null hypothesis, the standard model itself? So the data can tell you how well they go along with the null hypothesis if you compute the p-value of the null hypothesis. So I observe 10 events, I expect seven from the null hypothesis alone. What is the p-value under the null hypothesis? That will tell me the consistency of the data to the null hypothesis. And that will be a measure to know how much off you are if you, if you have to worry that you might have a signal on top of it or not. So the p-value of the null hypothesis is intrinsically the number which you can translate into the number of sigmas if you want, because if I see 20 events and the background is seven, I may claim that I have a signal. And the claim will be by saying the p-value of observing 20 events when the null hypothesis is seven is 310 to the minus seven or something. It, it's not, it's a little bit less. But you always refer to the p-value of the null hypothesis, okay? Uh, background, like how we are defining the null hypothesis there is uh, like, you are calculating the background only p-value and uh, you are referring that we have to calculate the p-value of null hypothesis. That is a null. So that is null. Yes. Background only is the, the background hypothesis is what you call the null hypothesis. The null in the sense that there is no signal. Okay. No signal, okay. Other questions? Yeah. How is the other definition that you gave or suggested, like uh, significance equals to square root of S plus B minus uh, square root of B is better than these? I mean, how, how does it not worsen the p-value? How does it what? Not worsens the p-value that these definitions of significance does. I, I didn't understand. In, you said in, in, this, in this, your slide that. Yeah, the, yeah, there, there is this uh, better figure of math. Yeah, so. In what uh, sense it is better, you want yeah, to ask? Because you said that uh, these two uh, definitions, that S over square root of B and S over square root of S plus B, they worsen the P value. They, they are very approximate in the sense that they. Uh, under, overestimate, sorry, they underestimate the p-value when you have few event counts. 
uh, that other estimator that I mentioned, the uh, square root of S plus B minus, okay? That one is a little bit better, but uh, there is no mathematical reason why it's better. You just have to compute it and compare it to the, to the actual p-value distribution, and you will see that it matches that distribution a bit better. It just, uh, it's just a mathematical approximation. There is one formula that is uh, a better approximation because it is uh, motivated by, by the, the distribution of the p-value. I think it involves uh, logarithms. I never remember it, but I can fish it out for you. But they are all approximations because uh, you have the problem that you have a discrete distribution, the Poisson. And the discrete distribution, yes, you can compute the variance because you just look at how distance from the mean you are, but there is nothing in between. So it is, uh, it is a chunk piecemeal distribution. And uh, so you have to use approximations. Thank you. Any more questions? One there. Uh, so how we can distinguish between the statistical uncertainty and systematic uncertainty? No, okay, you have to speak louder because I have trouble understanding. Uh, my question is like how we can distinguish between uh, which one is the statistical uncertainty and which part is the systematic uncertainty in our result? Uh, how we can distinguish between these two uncertainties? Yeah, I can tell you that. The statistical uncertainty is the first one. No, but seriously. <laughs> uh, uh, it's conventions because... We, in fact, typically put uh, the central value plus or minus the statistical uncertainty plus or minus the systematic uncertainty plus or minus theory errors or whatever if you want to do it. But it's a convention. Um, you, you have to distinguish it's a good thing because you have to ask yourself, yes, uh, what is the source of this uh, imprecision in my measurement, right? Uh, Typically, in every paper, you will not only have a clear distinction, this is statistical, this is systematic, but they will also go at length into telling you what are the sources of the systematic uncertainties that get into that final number that they put there, this, this systematic uncertainty. Otherwise, you cannot distinguish them. It's just a number, right? But uh, it has properties which uh, are very... Subtle, sometimes you can say, okay, it's the sum of many things, so it's Gaussian. But sometimes it's entirely not Gaussian. So for instance, a theory error, there is no reason that the next to leading order accuracy should be Gaussian. It may be better described as a box distribution because the theory said, well, it's certainly less than this and it's certainly more than that. So knowing more about the details of the systematic uncertainties, where they come from, will allow you to actually get a better feeling of, of the variation that you can expect from, 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 from the true value of what you measure. But there is no recipe. You have to look deep into the sources of the systematic uncertainties. But yes, the, 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 the zero order answer to the question is, in practice, what we do is we place the statistical uncertainty first and the systematic later. 